Um, hello. Is it working? Yeah. Is this one? Um, okay, uh, I'll make a brief introduction of our guest this evening, uh, Dr. Philippe Bloch. He's a associate professor at ETH Zurich. Um, and we first came across um, Philippe for his interesting um, contemporary take on graphic statics. And they've been developing the research further and building prototypes and also structural consultancy of like historic masonry structures based on the methods uh, that his group and like other people in, in, in MIT have been developing. Um, uh, and he's also co-founder of Auctiondorf, Dejung, um, and Block Consultancy. Um, uh, and he's visited uh, the DRL a couple of times uh, for reviews and, and such. And um, he's fairly active uh, in, in academia. He, he just came, came from a workshop in, uh, uh, RM, with the RMIT. Um, so with that, I would I'd like to invite uh, Philippe uh, for the lecture. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Charge. Thanks uh, for coming. Um, I'm pretty excited to be here, and I hope I can uh, intrigue you at least uh, about a surprising topic: uh, structures, um, and uh, show you what I'm doing. Um, I called it stone skills, new mas masonry shells. But uh, basically, what I do is I um, look at the past to try to come up with uh, interesting, better, or um, surprising ways to design um, uh, things. So uh, for me, it started uh, with this building. Um, when I went to MIT, actually uh, earlier at, uh, in the in Chardier's, um group at the DRL, I was reminded that I used to do kinetic things and all kind of uh, what I thought was uh, high-tech things uh, because I saw one of my projects as a reference. I went to MIT to uh, do this kind of high-tech stuff and I ended up uh, working on these structures. Uh, I ended up realizing that they are quite high-tech because uh, I'll just throw some numbers at you. Uh, perhaps you know these. These are these uh, beautiful fan vaults at University of Cambridge at King's College. They have a span about uh, 13 meters, and uh, they have a structural uh, depth in the middle. So these are stone slabs that are just held in compression. In the middle, it's only 10 centimeters, and then it goes to 15 centimeters at the end. So they obviously have been standing for many years, and they stand because they have a good structural form. Otherwise, you cannot balance these stones in space like that. If, so these numbers translated uh, are this, so this is about the this is actually exactly the thinness of these shells, and so they are unreinforced. So that is actually not such an obvious problem. So, and that, is, uh, that was the problem that was thrown at me by my uh, former advisor, John Oxendorf. Um, I'll just, so first I'll throw some introductory things at, at you to explain uh, where my work comes from, and then I show you some examples of things that we have been doing. I'll take a few shortcuts like this one. There is two very extreme ways to look at structures. One is to uh, design them for stress and material failure. And the second one is actually to look at them for equilibrium and stability. And then that is a geometrical problem. Uh, luckily, masonry uh, falls in the second category. Why luckily? Because uh, as you can see here with the drawing by Galileo, um, these, the problems of stress cannot be scaled, uh, while the problems of geometry can actually are scale less. That means that these master builders, these Gothic master builders, are actually pretty lucky because they could just come up with proportional rules. They could play with models, uh, with actually scale models on all scales to try to understand the stability of larger structures that they were building. So these are actually some plaster models, but they also, if you look at these very intricate uh, little vaults on side chapels and all of that. These were actually, in a way, experiments for the, ne the next projects that they were doing. 
And so they tested their ideas and then they could scale this up because uh, masonry is a problem of stability fundamentally and so this is a geometry problem. If you're not convinced, perhaps these few uh, 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 stills from the pillars of the earth, indeed, uh, the Gothic master builders used uh, uh, scale models uh, to uh, design their structures. This is a very powerful thing because uh, it's a unique type of problem that allows us really to one-to-one -one scale our experiments at a small scale. Um, we don't build models all the time, so one uh, way to visualize if something is, uh, or explain if something is stable or not, is a trust line. I don't know if you know this, but it's a theoretical line that uh, represents where the compressive forces want to go uh, in space. and then. This theorem is very powerful. It just says that you need to find a possible way that this structure can stand in compression. And if you find such a network of forces in 3D that fits within the geometry of your masonry structure, then it is sufficient, then you know that it will stand. So what is important about this? That is that actually for masonry structures, the problem becomes entirely geometrical, or at least uh, uh, fundamentally. Um, sorry, I'll still throw a few argumentation things at you. Um, here to the left is a, a linear elastic finite element analysis, the tools that modern engin engineers use, which are very highly appropriate to deal indeed with structures that are designed for stress. But uh, these two different arches, uh, they um, have a very, uh, as you can appreciate, a very similar colorful output. But then if we look at this very simplistic truss line, then we see that actually this thinner arch cannot have a compression-only solution that fits within the geometry. What does that tell us? That tells us that if you were to decenter this arch, it would directly collapse, and so it could never stand. So this, uh, this is just to say that this very simplistic approach that you just have to draw a line tells you, tells you quite a lot more than these uh, uh, elastic um, uh, solutions. It tells you about stability and collapse. So you can only imagine what the meaning is of these kind of uh, models applied to a lot of our he uh, heritage. And unfortunately, much of our heritage is being destroyed because of the use of totally inappropriate models. This is a beautiful, well, it's not that beautiful, but this is a very clear example. Uh, the, the Met in New York had these beautiful tile vaults. I'll tell you much more about these tile vaults later. These were unreinforced tile vaults, and they were replaced by a simple beam structure because the engineer in the 60s was unable to explain how these uh, shells were standing and how safe they were. Uh, the little anecdote that they needed to use uh, jackhammers to take these uh, shells down perhaps indicates a little bit how, how uh, well they behave. And also the PR material of the Guastavino company that built these shells, there is actually a little, a little shell hidden under this uh, gigantic pile of uh, iron uh, pieces. I think this is fairly convincing that these shells are uh, quite sturdy and quite redundant. All right, so that is maybe uh, a bit about that. Um, at the end of the day, this is the, the, pow the most powerful concept. It's the hook, Hooke's uh, inversion law that says, as hangs a flexible line, so but inverted will stand a rigid arch. The idea is, uh, we all know this idea, uh, particularly through one of the masters in equilibrium, Gaudi. The concept is, is that if something hangs under a certain loading condition, under pure tension, uh, if you only look at static equilibrium, you can flip this geometry, uh, and uh, this geometry will be in perfect compression. Um, so this is uh, the basis of many of these things. So you could actually explain the stability of a masonry structure by making these hanging models. We don't have time uh, for these hanging models uh, anymore. Uh, this uh, Gaudi only used uh, a model for the Colonia Goel. It took a highly skilled team 10 years. I doubt that we can convince our clients to wait 10 years to uh, fulfill the form finding. So luckily we made a few improvements. For example, graphic statics. I don't know if this is familiar, but uh, what's very nice about graphic statics, it's in a way a paper version 
of, um, of a hanging model and it uses these diagrams that represent the equilibrium in a, a hanging system. In detail, they were used extensively to explain masonry. This is uh, under different loading cases. Some people tried in 3D, but being stuck with the 2D drafting plane, this became very quickly, very tedious to use. For me, it started with this book at MIT, a beautiful book by William Wolfe. If you want to learn anything about graphic statics, I recommend this. He basically looked at a 3D structure by slicing it up into the arches. But as you can see, it was 42 years ago that anyone uh, opened this book at MIT. So either I was doing something um, revolutionary or my research was totally obsolete. Um, well, at least I got a job out of it. Um, so then I pushed this graphic statics and I extended this to 3D. Um, uh, this is just to give you a mental image. I will not go in too much detail, but everything that I will show is actually uh, based on this. What you see is that just with 2D diagrams, this is a layout or where, uh, a decision of, of where forces go. This is a diagram that exp explains the equilibrium of the structure, and from that we can very easily compute a compression-only network of forces. And how it works is that the equilibrium of every node in the system is represented by a closed vector polygon of forces in the other. So you see that, uh, that it's not only covering local equilibrium, but also global equilibrium. So the power of these diagrams, and this is a direct extension of graphic statics, is that you have at the same time an explicit and direct representation of both the form, the geometry of where the forces are for fl uh, flowing, and the forces. And you can directly manipulate these and steer them to um, control your design. How can you do this? Um, let's look at a very simple node. So here, if this node has equal amount of forces, remember these diagrams are vector equilibrium forces, so this is equal in all directions, you get a symmetrical structure. If you attract force in one direction, then your structure becomes more shallow. This sounds maybe totally confusing, it probably doesn't if you think of the opposite. For the same set of loads, if you have a hanging chain, if you have a very deep structure for the same load, you don't have to pull much, so it doesn't have a lot of horizontal pull. For the same load, if you want to make this structure very shallow, you need to pull much, much more. So if you do the inverse and you control this, you steer this yourself as designer, then you can decide to attract more force in one direction and so you make the structure more shallow in that direction. So this just for those of you who, who use uh, kangarooing grasshopper or who use some processing or some par particle springs, the difference with this is that you here explicitly decide, it's a design decision to redistribute the forces rather than just having a hanging net find a unique solution for the parameters that you gave it. All right, so this is then the first thing that we have. We, for a certain layout of where forces go, if it's equally distributed to forces, then it's uh, some sort of a symmetrical pillow-like geometry. If you attract forces, so longer lengths means more force attraction, then you get this butt shape because indeed your structure becomes more shallow in this direction. If you do this asymmetrically, then you get an asymmetric shape and so on and so on. So this explicit control really allows the designer with very simple diagrams to redistribute the forces and directly see uh, what the repercussion is in 3D. All right, but with this kind of forward approach, uh, this is perhaps uh, the start of something exciting. You cannot explain these kind of complex geometries. Again, this is another beautiful example in um, uh, Lisbon, the Geronimos Cathedral uh, Monastery. And uh, these geometries only have 10 centimeters and a very specific, uh, only a very specific compression only solution can explain how they stand. Um, Again, uh, this, this is maybe a little bit too detailed, but you can, just by formulating this problem and taking all these degrees of freedom, you can find exactly the balance of all the forces in the system that map perfectly to the middle surface of this geometry. And so this here, this pipe diagram, actually represents a compression-only 
network of forces that fits exactly in the geometry. And then here, this abstract diagram is actually uh, a representation of all the horizontal thrusts, so all the horizontal forces in the system. So all these little arches need to be balanced in this very specific distribution of forces to get there. So you can, I hope you appreciate that if you were to do this with a hanging model, you might need to do a few iterations to get to exactly this specific uh, equilibrium. All right, and then just to show that these, these things are being used in practice, I'm pretty proud that we saved Fort Jefferson from the client wanted to wrap it in a, a steel cage because it was uh, the client plus the engineer were convinced that it was going to collapse because a few stones fell off. But then we showed with our uh, 3D tools that actually there was nothing at all. And in fact, we signed that uh, this structure will be safe for the next 500 years. That is maybe a little bit bold, but that is um, at least it will not uh, get these uh, ugly blue br uh, braces for the rest of its life. Um, okay, but what is the point? So a little bit of build-up was to say that unreinforced masonry, historic masonry, needs a good structural form, otherwise it will collapse. But then if you fully control all the degrees of freedom, then you can start to design new efficient and expressive structural form. So for this, uh, we, we implemented some of these ideas in a, in a simple tool. It's called Rhino Vault. It's uh, available for free. We have thrown it, uh, for example, Shadje and his team at uh, Zahadit. Architects have played with this. It was quite remarkable to see Zahadit architecture in compression only within half an hour. So that was uh, kind of cool to see. So the thing with this tool is that uh, it's, it's implemented such that it is, one, that it is dummy proof, uh, and two, that you can really indeed ex explicitly redistribute the forces and then see what the result is. So here, for example, you attract the forces such. Oops, sorry. I hope you can imagine then what will happen because you attract the forces, you get this little crease of, or this little uh, undulation in the geometry. So it also makes you appreciate actually that almost anything is possible. There is no such thing as free form anymore if you properly support your shells. But uh, it tells you directly at what cost. So it shows you the proportion of the forces and it shows you what you need to do to um, get to certain geometries. So here, if we start from a shell, a compression shell inspired by the British Museum, which is not a compression shell at all, but if you start from this geometry and you start to, again, redistribute the forces, attract them differently like such, then you could uh, see that uh, maybe uh, Chris Williams could have uh, spiked up the design by Foster's a little bit by making some little bumps and by making it uh, asymmetrically. Uh, so this, this can be directly and quickly done just by, again, attracting the forces uh, differently. And then the last example of this tool, so all these things, this is uh, in real time, uh, and this is a slow version. Uh, here, this is a, uh, a little uh, geometric, uh, a little um, example inspired by Stuttgart 21. I don't know if you know about this project, but Fryoto beautifully designed it. It's very efficient shells, but then the engineers uh, in uh, Stuttgart decided that it needed to be reinforced heavily. So uh, this is then showing that uh, Fry was maybe not that wrong after all. But uh, anyway. <coughs> All right, so this is then uh, uh, Matthias and Lorenz, uh, two of my PhD students developed this tool, and uh, this was done in about five minutes. Uh, so this could be built in compression only, which means it could be built in unreinforced masonry, for example. Okay, but let's go to some examples. The, these are the three ways that one could uh, span masonry, uh, uh, span space in masonry, a European tradition on full formwork, this is um, a Nubian vaulting, and the Mexi the, in Mexico, they have some nice uh, um, uh, new evolutions there. And then here, the third one is a tile vaulting. The nice thing about the two last examples is that they don't need any formwork, so they can be built in space. 
All right, so this is how tile vaulting goes. Uh, using a fast setting mortar, you just built in stable sections in between the uh, boundary conditions. You do this in multiple layers with a fast setting mortar, and uh, then you can build up these shells. So there is a lot of examples in uh, the United States, like this is at the Bronx Zoo. This is the, actually the home of the elephants. Uh, this, maybe you have seen this at Grand Central Station. Actually, if you look up at, at many, many important buildings, for example, the Boston Public Library also, and you, you, you recognize these style patterns. This is not decoration, this is actually the structure itself. So these shells span almost 20 meters with just 15 centimeters of basically floor tiles, right? And so they're built also on top of that, they're built in space. Another example, uh, they are now being uh, really re-appreciated, these shells. For me, these are sensational. These are spiral uh, staircases, again, built in space with fast setting mortar and uh, no reinforcement. So this structure is standing without any reinforcement. And you see here happily standing with a lot of weight. Um, now using this approach that I uh, just threw at you uh, a couple of minutes ago, if you look if you choose a logic of forces that would represent the equilibrium of a dome, which means arch action to the supports and then hoop forces. So a dome with an oculus, so that is what you see here. You have arches going there and hoop forces in the other direction. If you flatten this dome, the only thing that changes is that the horizontal thrust becomes much, much higher because the structure is much more shallow. Remember, we, uh, the relationship between a deep structure has a small horizontal thrust and then exactly the same structure but shallow is, has much more horizontal thrust. Imagine now that you cut open this dome and you peel it open, then you still have the arch action going to the supports but now the hoop forces, instead of being balanced in the horizontal equilibrium, they now curl into 3D. And this is made clear because actually the force diagram is exactly the same. So that is the value of using, having this explicit control that you can now explain why these thin shell spiraling uh, staircases can be just standing there uh, without any steel or any other means of uh, taking bending. Uh, no surprise, the Guastavinos extensively used graphic statics to design their domes. And if you're interested in any of this more, uh, John, uh, well, this is, he should uh, give me a percentage because this appears in all my lectures. But it is really a cool book and it's, uh, it's basically from f for free on Amazon. Okay, so uh, this, this is what the Guastavino did. For me, the first time that I encounter this vaulting is here. This was a master uh, ma MARC project by Michael Ramage. He is here, he is now a lecturer at uh, University of Cambridge, and he built his little shell for his master thesis, being interested in it. Um, people found out that uh, Michael and his advisor, John Oxendorf, were shell builders, and they asked them to build uh, a shell in Dover. They said, yes, we can do it. So then the second shell that Michael built was this one. Uh, it is spanning 13 meters. It's again unreinforced, only 15 uh, centimeters thick. And uh, it's, um, uh, it's using only uh, local materials. Um, so John is, uh, was my advisor. He also is my partner in uh, our little humble consultancy. But we have a little bit of a healthy competition going on. So I wanted to do things a little bit better than him. So at ETH, I said, OK, let's try to do something better. So we worked on this uh, shell. The idea was to showcase our tools. So here we used Rhino Vault to redistribute forces. Um, the, as I said, the, one of the main advantages of Catalan vaulting is that you can build in space without formwork. But in this case, because we have a very specific 3D geometry, very precise 3D geometry, uh, we ran out of time and we used this cardboard guide work to trace this geometry. So. Uh, we quickly uh, used some scripts to generate these boxes, and then uh, uh, we could build our, uh, our shell uh, in space. Because these cardboard boxes can actually take a significant amount of load, we could actually cheat a little bit instead of always just staying in equilibrium in the in-between stages, we, sh we, co we could use the guide work also as uh, somehow as form work. So uh, this was to express 
so more flowing patterns that express the three-dimensional nature of uh, the shell. Then, uh, very convenient, I had a little mason, Lara Davis, on my team. So uh, she uh, spent uh, five weeks of suffering building this shell. Um, we took the information of the structural diagram to embed in between the different layers some structural uh, ribs. Uh, in typical Catalan vaulting, you build the ribs first and then you patch up in between, but this di didn't make sense here because we had a fully 3D solution, so we didn't have these pronounced arches, so we didn't want to express this either. So here we see some images, and what's nice is that you can have directly the information of where the forces are attracted, so where you want to embed these ribs. So this was, of course, uh, taken from Candela, who also has these hidden, thickened uh, ribs in his structures some different end conditions. And then this is, these are these five weeks of suffering by Lara. And there we were. Uh, one thing, because we were cheating, the guide work was also somehow phone work. A very important thing when you build such a funicular, a compression only shell, it is designed for a dominant loading and it is not happy at all with point loads or very uh, heavy asymmetric loads. And if you decenter your foam work asymmetrically, it is actually exactly the same as loading it heavily asymmetrically. So we needed to make sure that we had a decentering mechanism that makes sense. So we, work, uh, we worked on a very sophisticated system. This is a spacer dry, this is a spacer wet, so this was tested with some flower pots. And then we were uh, convinced that this system would work, so we put the entire scaffolding onto all these little cardboard spacers. They were all in tubes for the, for the full six weeks that uh, the phone work was standing. At the end of the six weeks, we cut open all the tubes, we poured uh, the water, uh, water in it, and uh, lo and behold, everything uh, came down at the same time, which was a very pleasant surprise, so we could uh, safely decenter it. And this was then the, uh, the first prototype that we did, just to show, uh, hopefully you agree, some geometries that uh, might surprise uh, certain people uh, that this uh, stands in compression. I enjoyed the, the, uh, the heated discussions with my colleagues in civil engineering that insisted because this was anti-clastic, which means negatively, negatively double curved, that there had to be tension all over here but this is somehow a little bit hard to do because these are just uh, plastered together uh, masonry tiles. And then, by the way, you might have noticed that I, I skipped over this quickly. One big disadvantage of having this full guide work is that you could not clean up the, the, the seams while doing it. So this would now need to be taken care of in a second stage, but Lara had to fly out to India, so we lost her, and no one else was motivated to clean this thing up. But, uh, so this was it. Um, as uh, probably you can imagine, we had no building permit for uh, this thing. So ETH Immobilien was getting a little bit nervous about this strange structure that attracted all kinds of kids in the weekend. Um, so we used our tools to try to see how much load this structure could be, but we would not take ourselves serious as uh, master builders if we didn't do a, a ghetto load test ourselves. So this is a a very Swiss precise loading condition here. Mm -hmm. This is actually three tons uh, of uh, uh, weight exactly at one point load. My colleagues in engineering uh, thought that this was a great case to, do, to use their new fiber optic sensors to measure the collapse. I was also hoping for an educational movie, but uh, nothing happened except for this, uh, this tower collapsing onto the vault and still nothing happened, so it had to go. This is uh, Matthias, he programs typically, so this was a very exciting day. <laughs> keep going, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> so you see actually how sturdy it is. That is of course that all the forces need to go through this leg. So we, by the way, we thought that this little thing would already do something, but. Uh. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> 
Okay, <laughs> this is a little bit surprising. It stands in cantilever. The reason for this is, of course, the scale of the fault, that there is some bending capacity. If you blow this up, this would not be true. If you don't believe me, the next project, I hope I will convince you that uh, this is the case. Again, you see how sturdy these things are. Um, so it is not only cool. Finish it, man. It's not only cool to uh, destroy things, but it also makes you appreciate that nice and good double curvature makes a very <laughs> redundant and uh, sturdy, a very redundant and sturdy system. This is uh, Tom, my overly excited postdoc. And then, very appropriate, some, uh, some physical uh, project to seaplane for those of you who use uh, Rhino. All right, then um, this was the expression of a smooth geometry. Then uh, last October with uh, Dave Pygram of Supermaneuver, I did a design build workshop at UTS in Sydney. And the challenge was to explore a ripped uh, Catalan vaults uh, with the students and they got introduced to all of that, to the tools, to masonry, to structures, because they actually don't have a structures class at UTS. And uh, they built all of this in 10 days. So we uh, created this full formwork for the ribs, then we built the ribs with a high structural depth so that they could stand by themselves. And then afterwards, we could then patch up the, the, the the parts. So this was another expression, another possibility of trying to do something new with Catalan vaulting. Instead of having these linear arches that you patch up, now because we have the form finding tools, you can have these networks of uh, interacting ribs that then are stable and that you can patch up uh, afterwards. All right. So we already covered that unreinforced masonry needs a good structural form. It will collapse uh, uh, otherwise. Um, but then if you actually know where the forces are going, then you can design with very little or very low quality material. An example for this is this project. I, uh, perhaps some of you know it in Mapping <coughs> Rubio by Peter Rich. The structural designers were John Oxendorf and Michael Ramage, and I did uh, the structural analysis for these vaults. Um, the idea here is that basically uh, these vaults are using soil press tiles uh, with only 8% uh, uh, cement in it to stabilize them. They were done with manual labor and uh, they were done by the local community. That is because it was an, a poverty relief program. The site is very distant, so it didn't make sense to fly in uh, any material, so everything needed to be done with local skills and local labor. So here we see Michael explaining what will happen. These people were until a week before that, they were farmers or carpenters. This is, by the way, James Bellamy, the master mason uh, from New Zealand that we sent for all these projects. And here you see that they were not quite convinced yet what the white folks were telling them to do when they built their uh, first uh, little shell. But then this is one week later. So uh, this is typical Catalan vaulting. So here you first built on full formwork the arches. This is actually not formwork, this is just guide work, but because we are uh, working with very low skilled uh, um, uh, laborers, basically they had non, no skill in masonry the week before this, uh, it is important to trace the geometry very carefully because this is just dirt, soil, you need to then waterproof the structure very carefully, so that will be the black uh, next layer. And then on top of that, for architectural reasons, there is these uh, stones, uh, this was to blend in better into the landscape, but actually it is also very uh, meaningful for structural reasons because by having this very heavy load, it makes the dominant self-weight even more dominant. And so it means that uh, the shape that the structure wa des uh, was designed for uh, stays uh, um, uh, more happy during its lifetime because you have this very heavy weight. So live loads would have less of an impact. Um, an additional thing, yeah, no, let me, sorry, let me skip on. What's really nice with these projects, I have done now a few, I'll show you the next one in Ethiopia, is that it's great to, uh, the, the, the pride and the, the, uh, that people take in uh, the new skills and these new structures. Here, uh, look how thin you can go, just a little detail about these tiles. 
they're actually so weak in bending, they're about 25 centimeters, that if you hold them on one side, they just break in bending. So that's why it's very important to stay nicely in compression. But you see, this can be so thin if you know exactly where the forces are going, you build in space. And these are the larger vaults that have a span of uh, almost 20 meters. So here you see for some scale, uh, these are basically um, just dirt uh, held in space because they follow exactly where the compression forces want to go. You can do floor systems without needing any reinforcement steel because the permanent shell is always nicely in compression. And if you use lo local materials, then it nicely blends in. Uh, this image for me was important because uh, when you talk to uh, people over there, they're sick of uh, Westerners coming with uh, cheap solutions that look cheap. And they ask me, would you want to live in what you propose? And when I see these images, I typically answer, hells yeah, uh, because I think these things are fairly uh, elegant, even though they are literally dirt cheap. And then here, the floor system, if you have a very shallow vault, of course, it trusts a lot. So these, you need these tension ties to help the edge beams, to relieve the edge beams. But they can then uh, be integrated as lighting fixtures and all of that. OK, and then we translated this to Ethiopia. This is how the, the so-called low-cost housing is done. You see, they waste a lot of material uh, uh, for the wood. Uh, they need to import everything because they don't have precision uh, timber formwork, they don't have reinforcement steel, they don't have cement. Uh, so basically, it's a very high cost to mimic our Western uh, building paradigms. So uh, together with the Addis Abeba uh, University, the, Institute, the Ethiopian Institute of Architecture, Building Construction and City Development, we started to work on a prototype to train the people on uh, these uh, new techniques uh, to do some workshops at the university to train people on all levels, on the vocational training, the architects, the building planners, the engineers. Uh, an important thing to say about this uh, disclaimer is that as it also doesn't make sense to build unreinforced in regions of high seismicity, it is also important to know and understand the quality of the materials, of the soils that you can use. So we, we uh, work together with Crater, experts in earth construction, to teach people uh, how to assess soil locally on the field, but then also how to do uh, laboratory tests. And then we built this prototype, the Sustainable Urban Dwelling un Unit, also called ZUDU. Um, important for me was with the, the South African project was a very expressive project. It was a highly engineered project. It was a highly controlled project. And that was for a museum and for another purpose. Here we wanted to come up with a model that, was, that could be safely copied. So during construction, we all, always had this hanging chain hanging there. And the hanging chain was basically used to form the geometry of the vault. So here it is. An advantage of having just a single curvature vault is that you can describe it just with uh, straight lines and then build it in space. So here, Lara is teaching uh, local uh, people that we found outside of the doors at the university. They actually heard that something exciting was going on and good for them because now they're being sent as teachers to different parts in Ethiopia. Um, so here, the floor system with some stiffeners. These stiffeners are then filled with a stabilizing soil, and this then becomes the floor. And these are some last images. This was with my colleague Dirk Hebel. And as I said, important to have a safe technology transfer. Uh, this uh, exactly where this shape com comes from, always uh, as a reference. OK, uh, then for the top floor of the shell, we were inspired by these Nubian vaults. In Mexico, they go a little bit further and do these beautiful structures. This is how it works, because you have them leaning uh, against the corner. You build in stable arches. You use a lighter brick. You can just, again, build without any formwork. So this is a very efficient technique, but much more constraining when it comes to the shapes uh, compared to the Catalan vaulting. And then uh, in Mexico, they do these kind of shapes. And if you really master the techniques, you can get, in compression only, built without any formwork, quite some interesting shapes going. So that is what we use them for the top floor. 
uh, because uh, this one is exposed to the elements, we needed some good double curvature and we didn't need to save on the structural depth of the floor system. To push the prototype a little bit more, we wanted to waterproof it also in natural means. And so uh, we got introduced to this uh, cactus waterproofing. Uh, this is basically fermented cactus. Uh, the anic this comes from Me uh, Mexico. This is basically one step before tequila, something equivalent. And apparently how this came about is that they were making their, their, their alcohol, perhaps drinking alcohol while making their alcohol. They poured over this mix and they saw that from that point onwards the floor was impermeable. And so they started cladding this on the buildings to waterproof them. So that is what we did. So this is the result. It looks ve very boxy and boring. That is exactly the point because this is a building that is 90% uh, local soil and still looks like a boring concrete box, which uh, our Ethiopian colleagues insisted that this is a sign of modern living and uh, modern construction, but then still with some nice hints on the inside uh, of um, uh, the techniques that were used. After the South Africa project, we were invited, John and, and I, to um, do a little installation for the design triennial at, at the Cooper Hewitt. So we decided to give a little twist about local materials, and this is a shit vault because the tiles are made out of um, shit bricks, uh, which means that they're 100% post-consumer wa waste, of which 30% actually, res well, cleaned up uh, raw sewage. We thought that this was appropriate to put in the, this exhibition to build for the other 90, and uh, it was particularly appropriate next to all these shiny objects. Um, but basically anything you can compact, you can then start stacking and building. All right, let's then maybe go to the, the, the applications that I find most interesting, the ones on full form work. The first model that we made was actually such an application. Here, this diagram is maybe important to look at. You see that there is a lot of force being attracted in the back edge. This is the model. It's the smallest thing I made, but it's a 3D printed little thing. And it stands without any glue, just in compression with certain zones of only two millimeters. If you wonder how we made this, we have this nice puddle, puzzle with this cake form that we flip. Then you have the horizontal restraints on the side so that it can trust and really work in 3D. Then you can flip it and there it stands. And then to show that we are indeed not cheating, that there is no glue involved, uh, this little Maybe you notice know it's a black colored uh, individual. It's again Matthias, he likes uh, drama. So, um, but it's, these, these models are actually very useful because you really sense where the forces are going. And you also appreciate how much redundancy there is. Remember there was most of the force in the back arch, so that is now stabilizing uh, the, the other half of the structure here. Another thing about masonry structures is they are, they are typically fairly deep so you can imagine different force paths that actually stabilize the structure until too much abuse. We use this also to calibrate uh, new tools. Uh, this we do in our, if you come and visit us at ETH, uh, uh, maybe the robots of Gramatio Kohler are a little bit more well known than our little lab, but we are now hiding the robots behind, so you will see our lab before you see their uh, flashy robots, right? And so we, do th we have a testing table to relate the differential settlements of the supports to 3D collapse. Okay, but if we want to build these structures, these, these volumetric structures, a big challenge is stereotomy, how to cut up this geometry. So here for these nicely sophisticated shapes, this is Westminster Abbey here, right? You see that there is a nice logic of how they're being cut up. And this logic also has to do with the logic of the force flow in the structure. This is how they did it in those days. We might be a little bit further along, uh, but the key thing is that if you have more freeform looking geometries that morph from one geometry to the other, the key thing is that you want all the interfaces to be as perpendicular as possible to the flow of forces, to avoid sliding failure and all of that so that it's nicely locked into place. So we have these little, um, these little uh, tools that allow us to do this. 
So here, for example, you can project patterns and then uh, it constantly takes the, the structural flow of forces into account. This is, this is all okay. And all the faces are aligned as close as possible uh, to be perpendicular to avoid sliding failures. Because we are designers, we also want to be able to draw on the fly and to lay out these patterns. This is actually also an excuse because you can imagine if you morph from different geometries, you have these tough singularities in between two things coming together and it's always easier as human being to um, uh, negotiate and mediate between all these things instead of throwing it into an algorithm. Um, the master builders would not build their stuff like this. This is about the most inefficient way to deal with stone. It is very time consuming, very expensive. Um, it's just really silly. So uh, because I'm building up to actually this is, uh, we are doing this research because we actually have a real project that will be built like this. We had to look into more efficient stone cutting machine uh, um, techniques. For example, with these large blade saws that come in with multiple axes or these wire saws, these are diamond encrusted. So this is basically a hot wire cutter for adults, right? And um, if you look at these 3D geometries, then you can nicely approximate them with ruled surfaces. We thought that this was a solution, so we made a, a little uh, uh, CNC controlled wire cutter. Instead of using robotic arms that moves, forms stuff in space, we didn't want to go to that. Why? Because these degrees of freedom are exactly the same degrees of freedom of exec existing stone cutting machines. And so we were asked, we were commissioned to advise on the client and the stone fabricator to choose the, ma the machine that we needed. So we did these tests. Because these very sophisticated, there is even versions with nine axes of control of these wire cutters, but they don't have any software to control them. So we had to um, uh, sketch up a software to then control this wire cutter. So this software approximated the the, the arbitrary geometry into the closest fit ruled surface and then uh, design the lead in lead out paths uh, to then cut this. Of course in real stone masonry uh, you would not cut away the top part, it would, uh, it would crash the, the wire or collapse on the rest of the stone. But again you will see that uh, a person dressed in black, <laughs> Matthias will appear and he, li he likes a little bit of drama. So here he is with the uh, unveiling and luckily indeed the piece was always uh, in it. So in this piece we also embedded these, uh, these registration, these notches at the interfaces. This is important because if you build this in real scale, the problem of registration and the accumulation of 3D tolerances is very important. So you need to have these shapes that naturally fit into each other. So okay, this se seemed like the solution, but then we contacted the constructors and in reality, because the wire is bowing so much, you can actually only have uh, a tolerance of even only five centimeters. So that was not sufficient at all. And the reason is, is that these wire cutters are extremely efficient when you cut straight. And so they're typically used for rough cutting and then they're being uh, made more uh, precise with some CNC machines. So this collaboration with uh, Escobedo Construction started four years ago. Um, this is for a vaulted multi-purpose uh, um, uh, thing in uh, Texas, in Austin, Texas. The main span is 30 meters. Um, this is an, an initial design sketch. There's many of the architectural uh, features missing. But uh, the idea is that this is a cut stone, so uh, every piece is different. Uh, unreinforced and on top of that dry stone. So we, oh, I said that already, sorry. So no mortar uh, 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 used. So that is why we could not use these wire cutters. Uh, we needed to go to much more um, uh, precise techniques. This uh, shell was actually designed with a free plug-in. Maybe we have some tricks up our sleeves uh, internally, but it is exactly the same. It's Rhino Vault. And what I'm showing here is that if you have a typical hanging shape where you have no control of the geometry, this might be the force distribution. But then this tool allows you to explicitly redistribute the forces, the proportional 
distribution of forces to get to certain effects. So for example here, what we did at the end now generates these flaring edges because we wanted to have a geometry that is not the typical funicular Gaudi-esque kind of uh, obvious funicular shape, but we wanted to have these, these features that perhaps are more surprising for unreinforced masonry. Uh, then we took the force flow to tessellate, so here all these faces are as perpendicular as possible, and the dovetail geometry is to have this natural interlocking system once you assemble them. But then now this is when it gets uh, fun. We, I had uh, two MIT interns for the summer, which is great. So I had some little um, uh, vaulting, little vaulting construction slaves. And uh, the little dots are actually just registration uh, because uh, these were 800 pieces. We could test some decentering uh, uh, logics. Um, uh, and then there it is standing. Um, so this is again standing without any glue. Um, for those of you who were maybe in the Saadit room of the Venice Biennale, you might have noticed if you pushed, if you had pushed this model that it was glued. Uh, that was because we indeed expected that people would be curious and it would have been a pity that the first visitor would have collapsed our structural <laughs> model. So this is actually a real structural model because as I said in the beginning, these scale models work principally the same as a large scale. We wanted to have all these specific features, like this is the typical eye opening uh, of Fry Otto, but this is known of course for tension structures, not at all for compression structures. The flaring edges at the end is an, an homage to the famous shell builder Heinz Isler, again in a very different material. This is in reinforced concrete, so here these, these edges that flare up, and this is possible uh, due to a very careful redistribution of forces. Okay, but then to show that we were indeed not cheating and not losing the model after the first visitor, as I said, we included this video. Uh, this, don't worry, this is kind of uh, a Godzilla jumping exactly on the edge. This is very unlikely to happen. Uh, but we wanted to again show and feel and sense where the forces are going and then also have this nice um, high speed collapse things. The client uh, asked me to send this movie for purposes of um, clarifying to the city council in Austin uh, what is happening, but he asked to maybe uh, omit this part because he uh, <laughs> um, he had a feeling that the, they would get a little bit nervous seeing this. <laughs> uh, this is then a horizontal acceleration test. So actually now the plate is put on, on rollers and so there is a heavy uh, horizontal acceleration. Luckily everything is bigger in Texas, so are the foundations it seems because there is 0.000001% chance of an earthquake. And so this might also not happen. Uh, no, this will not happen. And um, yeah, so now doing the numbers with the stone fabricated, this is about eight, 800 pieces. This would mean that their machines would be running for three and a half years, just cutting all the stones. That is a little bit ridiculous. So we will reduce the sizes to the maximum size possible in stone. And so uh, the slats will be two meters by three meters, and then a thickness of 30 centimeters to a meter 20. And then MFI uh, is our client in Texas who has been uh, extremely nice to give us a total carte blanche to just, the only demand was make something as sensational as possible. So that is a very nice client to have. And then this is where it was. No. All right, but then uh, another uh, challenge is to use these machines. So it's all nice and a nice academic exercise to have an entire structurally informed fabrication aware digital design process. Uh, the real challenge is if you really need to build these things. So for this, Matthias went for three weeks to Escobedo Construction to look at the strategies of cutting. So these are the sequences. First, you do the outside geometry. You leave these pieces out. What's important about that is that the registration of the piece that is needed to flip it over to have the other side is entirely precise, uh, precise because it's controlled by the CNC. So you don't count on this top surface to be flat. 
because the depth of these grooves exactly identify why the, where the part is. So you cannot be more precise. So this is then what you do on this side, then you flip it over on some brackets, then you did the other side, and then you cut that, and at the end you can cut it off, and the last part is being manually removed. So what's nice then is that I've been working with Escobedo Construction for the last four years, so they trust me. In extension, they trust Matthias. So he was allowed to hack their uh, $1 million machine that they bought for this project. And um, then to write the, the own co uh, the, his own code to simulate the speed and the most efficient way to cut the stone. to check that you don't either kill anyone or uh, bump into something uh, while turning around and while cutting. Again, the reason that you have to write these things yourself is because the main clients that they have are kitchen tabletops and uh, grave tombstones and things like that. So you don't need these kind of strategies, but because there was a logic of similar pieces into the geometry, we could optimize this and customize our cutting strategies. So these are the very first pieces that are being bu built at uh, a third of the scale. We're using a Texas, uh, uh, well, how is it called? A cream, Texas cream. This is a soft limestone. The reason for this is that because we go dry, we don't have any mortar to distribute the stresses. Um, if you have any imperfection at the interface, they will just be uh, crushed and so uh, it's also easier to cut. So you have this big blade saw, so it has a bed of 50 meters by 10 meters here, and then the blade saw has a diameter of uh, two meters, but this is a small version that is mounted. All right, so um, uh, this project makes me nervous. Um, it is uh, a really great opportunity. I can design, uh, design it together with my team. I am on top of that the engineer, uh, and uh, they put me on the board of the construction company that will build it, so that is uh, pretty cool, but uh, it will be built, and you can imagine that there is still a lot of challenges that we need to solve. Uh, for example, how will we build this, uh, this uh, phone work? Uh, so there we are working together with Perry Systems in Munich that also did, for example, the Mannheim grid shell by Fry Otto or did the, um, the, the paper uh, undulating pavilion by uh, Shigeru Ban in, uh, in, the Hanover, in Hanover. Um, no, yes, I think so. Uh, and uh, so they are, convinced that they can do it, but so these are big questions that we still need to solve because as I said, if we don't decenter this vault at the same time, it's the same as heavily loading it asymmetrically and so we might get uh, some challenges. The client insists that I say instead of if this gets built, when this gets built, so I hope that in a year or two I can come back and share you um, hopefully great, great successes of this thing uh, standing in space, right? So here we are, the first three pieces of uh, this shell standing. Okay, so um, this to wrap up, um, I started by looking at historic structures and then what I try to show you uh, in this lecture is that um, even by learning indeed from these master builders, by understanding how these structures work, that even literally for masonry you can already apply in very different applications uh, you can create some new forms. This is a very low-tech construction and low-tech design application. High-tech design, it's a, it's a sophisticated 3D form, but it's low-tech construction, and there is nothing low-tech about this structure, so I try to show you a range of projects. But what's important, though, is that we, I stick to masonry because it's the most dramatic vehicle to basically show that our digital tools are not a cheat, that they really work. Because as you saw with the structural models, if it doesn't have the good geometry, it will collapse on you directly. And so in that sense, it is a good structural form, geometry, this kind of uh, hint that a lot of 
almost freeform or blobby looking things can be possible if you know how to support your shell and how to redistribute the forces. This is true for any material. And just to give you a hint, this is a project that we did uh, with uh, Swartz and Jans, my architects. Uh, my PhD student, Diedrich Venendal, did this. This is for a landscape bridge. This would be a tin shell. The local engineer suggested that we needed these big beams um, this is going back 60 years in time because this is not necessary at all. So luckily Diedrich went with a second opinion and brought a very convincing structural model. This is a Pringle keeping uh, 250 times its self-weight in a very unfortunate loading condition. Uh, just to say that there is something to be said about efficient shells. But one issue of course of shells is that they're, they're very expensive to make. Uh, Candela had this very elegant solution of these ruled surfaces. The high parts could be built with straight elements for the formwork, but you still see how much uh, material is needed to construct this formwork, also very labor intensive. This is the example of the Rolex Center by Sana at EPFL. And uh, this was a very precise and very expensive formwork for system as well. So the concept here, is to use a mixed cable net uh, fabric formwork system that basically we developed algorithms that allows you to pre-stress all the cables such that you can approximate almost any target geometry that you give that is globally anticlastic, globally double curved. Why can we do this? Because it's exactly the opposite of the masonry problem. There we need to be in pure compression, here we need to be in pure tension, and so it's the same idea, but then we apply it differently. And so this would then be a way to uh, build these large-scale structures. I'm now working on a project. I've been fortunate to, I'll, I'll build one of these things in Zurich for an apartment building. Not, not building, we do one unit in this building and we will employ this system to basically uh, generate uh, the roof. So what I do is I learn from the past to design a better future. That's maybe a little bit of a cocky statement. But I just want to stay with, with, say with this is that I really believe that, there, that we can learn a lot from uh, the old master builders. There is a lot of knowledge that is lost. Remember the first image that I showed you? These thin shells, shell uh, masonry structures that are only 10 centimeters as thin as an eggshell that are spanning 13 meters. Not many modern engineers would. There is many reasons for this, like liability. We have other liabilities than in those days. But not many engineers would be, feel comfortable enough to s sign off on, on these kind of structures. This just an, as an indication that these master builders really did sensational things. And if we really understand these structures better, I think we can really um, do some exciting things. This is not only true for masonry. But as I said, if you understand masonry as a most dramatic vehicle, you can really uh, tackle any material. Um, well, that's it. Thanks a lot for uh, your attention. I'm happy to take uh, further questions. I see that I filled my entire hour because my plan was like look at the clock at what time it is, but it is totally dark here, so I had no <laughs> idea what time it was. So uh, thank you for still being here, and I'm very happy to take questions. Hey, very, very inspirational uh, lecture. Appreciate it. Um, I had a question on the, the tectonics of the Austin project in creating the, the tool path sort of mechanism there. Are you coordinating the tool paths of the masonry as like an ornamental feature on the, on the masonry blocks? How is that being incorporated? <coughs> uh, that, that's, that could be an option. It will depend actually on, uh, even though we got carte blanche, I am committed to make it as efficient as possible. And so it's, uh, and together with the client, we are committed to showcase a project that pushes all the efficiencies, even though it is crazy stone and all of that, and it uses a lot of technology. So it will actually depend on um, what is the trade-off. So if it is feasible to do the tool paths to express some flowing patterns and things like that, 
uh, at not an extreme uh, expense, then uh, we really would like to uh, include this. Because it's a performance area, uh, also acoustical issues will come into play, so it might well be that the pattern, so this we still need to examine further, that the pattern is actually triggered uh, by the acoustical needs to have a diffusing pattern rather than a smooth one. And so this, this will depend, and uh, these are still some questions. Um, I would say in general, don't do it. It's kind of silly. Um, the the yeah. Okay, good point. I was going to use another example. Uh, the Hagia Sophia actually is also still standing. It did collapse partially uh, once and had to be rebuilt and is still standing, but the Mexico example is quite remarkable. And uh, you saw maybe how hard it was to destroy our shell that only had two layers. It is because it has a nice double curvature. The same actually for the shells. The projects that I showed are by uh, Alfonso Ramirez Ponce, a friend of mine. He insists that I call him his friend, but he is 74 years old, so it's a bit awkward. <laughs> but. Um, uh, but these are amazing shells, and they're all still standing. They all survived this heavy earthquake in uh, 85 or 86 that any engineering sh school uses as an example of, of uh, to deal with earthquakes. And uh, the reason for this is most likely that on top of the, the inherent that this is designed for a dominant loading case, the nice double curvature makes them very uh, robust and very redundant. Um, how can you look at this? That is, if you have something that is uh, uh, synclastic, so positively double curved, you can imagine for any loading case, you can imagine a lot of load paths that can go to the supports. So the thing is, is that that is one way to explain why these shells are so stiff, because there is many uh, load paths that you can imagine. Um, but still, I would not necessarily uh, push your luck by now uh, uh, building new structures in such zones. Um, as a background, actually, the project in Ethiopia is in a moderately seismic zone. And I forgot to point out that actually in the structure, there is embedded. That is why it's 90 percent uh, uh, soil and sorry, local materials and not 100%, there is actually a rigid frame embedded to take the lateral loads. Plus, in between the layer, there, is, uh, there are some fi fibers embedded just to add some ductility to, to the structure so that there is no sudden collapse. So these kind of things, there are these, there are these few things that you can do, but in general, uh, you don't want to build in seismic regions. But you're quite right that in Mexico, they're still standing, which is remarkable. The same, by the way, for... Uh, these thin concrete shells and all of that. Uh, actually, Shadje, your shells are still standing, right, in, in Mexico? And there was a mild earthquake, right? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for your lecture. It was really inspiring. Thank Could you use some tension force to actually counterbalance an earthquake situation? Like I imagine you don't want any tension, but can you embed in your system some tension cables <coughs> that could come into place whenever an earthquake kick kicks sure. in, so sure. you could actually ground it? Well, uh, actually this is, uh, this is uh, being used in, in uh, retrofits of historic structures, actually more responsible retrofits where they don't start drilling rods into it or wrap it in full carbon fiber. Exactly what you're saying is that they wrap it with somehow a net that catches the vault as soon as it wants to collapse. So basically, it doesn't allow the, sh the, the, the arch. So if you imagine there is a, a seismic event, then the arch starts to rock. And basically what they do is they wrap it. They don't glue it on it because this is destructive. But they basically just offset, make a tension zone so that if the vault wants to start, it cannot because it's constrained by this element. So that is maybe not exactly what you said, but that is a, 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 more, a more appropriate technique that is lately being developed to, uh, to um, 
make sure that our heritage, our heritage is not collapsing under heavy seismic conditions. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then the other thing is just the embedding of fibers to make it, but that is more a secondary thing. I'm thinking that even Candela had some tension wires in his structures. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, but these are these are uh, uh, anticlastic shapes that count on compression, main compression in one direction, and the stiffening comes from tension in the other direction. So there, you need to you need to have these elements. Uh, yeah, that's right. All right, but not too many people left, so thanks a lot for still being here, and uh, I appreciate the invitation, and uh, yeah. Anyway, my name is Block. I play with Block, so you can easily find me on the <laughs> web. Right. Yeah.